Hi everyone and welcome to today's Germination Retail Roundtable webinar. My name is Mark Zinkowitz and I serve as editor for Germination and I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is wheat breeding, followed by a new varieties update from Secan. We'll hear from an expert who will offer some insights on the world of wheat breeding. And then we'll hear from Jim Downey about what new varieties Secan has in store for the 2020 season. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Secan, for their support. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at germination.ca following the proceedings. During the presentation, you'll no doubt have some questions. Please type these into the chat box at any time, and we'll address them during the Q&A sessions that we'll hold after each speaker finishes their presentation. If we don't have time for all questions, you'll receive an emailed response. Our first speaker is Richard Cuthbert, wheat breeder at AAFC Swift Current. His research focuses on the efficient adoption of technology to enhance wheat variety development, as well as enhancing resistance to fusarium head blight and mycotoxins, improving stripe rust resistance, improving water use efficiency, and developing new predictive quality testing assays. He has co-developed 24 spring wheat and Durham cultivars. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you to Germination for the invitation to uh, speak today. It's always uh, fun to talk about wheat and uh, where we've been and where we're going. So uh, to start today, I'm going to give a little bit of background on wheat breeding and um, our team and uh, where we're going with wheat in the next uh, in the next coming decades. I'd start with saying that it's not just myself at Swift Current who's uh, behind a lot of the wheat varieties that you see, but uh, uh, there's a, a list of scientists that are working on on wheat breeding at at Swift Current and also basic research related to wheat breeding. And one person I'd point out in particular is Dr. Ron Knox in wheat pathology and biotechnology. Ron Knox has been with the uh, group for uh, many years. He's approaching a retirement actually, and he's been uh, quite involved in the uh, adoption of a lot of biotechnology when it was just cutting edge, and now it's routinely used. And uh, we're we're quite thankful for his participation in the Swift Current group. Also, uh, Dr. Ron DePau, who is now retired from AAFC, and uh, many people will know the name Ron DePau in wheat breeding, so uh, a couple people to point out. We often say that uh, it takes a village to raise a child, and that's true for wheat breeding. It takes uh, uh, quite an army to develop wheat varieties. There's a lot of detailed work over a long period of time, so dedicated staff is very, very important. And, Pictured here is a photograph of our, a lot of our wheat breeding crew, our laborers and technicians that are involved in, in wheat variety development as well. We're quite fortunate for funding that we receive, which is primarily from farmers and the wheat checkoffs. So looking back, we always like to kind of keep an eye on where we're at um, uh, with insured acreage variety share and Swift Current's been fairly successful. In Durham's, we're about 77% of the market. For CWRS, 67%, and CPS, 63% for 2019. And we often use the uh, figures that about 50% of the world Durham trade and 8% of the world wheat trade comes from Swift Current uh, varieties. So that's those are fairly big numbers, and we're, we're quite proud of that. We're a fairly small group working in a small center at Swift Current in Saskatchewan, but we're impacting uh, globally. So when we talk about improving bread wheat varieties, it can be broken down into three broad areas, agronomics, disease and pest resistance, and end use quality. And those three groups mimic the registration system quite well. When we go to the Prairie Recommending Committee for Wheat Rind Triticale, where new wheat lines are, are supported for registration and cultivation in Western Canada, um, there's three teams, an agronomic team, a disease team, and a quality team. And those teams look at the merits of the wheat line for entry to uh, registration in Canada. Uh, I have two photographs there. On the left, you see red fife, and on the right, you'll see AAC Elida, the new wheat variety that we're talking about today. We grow a lot of historical wheats uh, at Swift Current, and it's a nice area to go walk out to in July, August, September during, uh, during the growing season and look at where we've been over 150 years of wheat breeding in, in Canada where we are now and where we're going. So all our new increases are out there. 
and uh, new varieties that are currently available to farmers and, and the historical ones like Red Fife, Marquis, back 100, 150 years ago. And you can see that we've made some improvements there. Red Fife is quite tall, quite lodgy, has a lot of improve, room for improvement for disease resistance. And AAC Elida, we can see it's much stronger, a little bit shorter statured, so less straw to deal with and uh, quite a bit better in disease resistance. Talking about challenges in wheat breeding, another three areas we intertrait relationships. There's a number of traits within agronomics, disease resistance, and end use quality that need improvement. And a lot of them have a push and pull. So and something else often gives. And in agronomics, we can we can talk about maturity, yield, and protein. Yield and protein is the uh, nice example because improving yield, you tend to get lower protein higher protein, lower yield, and maturity. Well, if you lengthen your days to maturity, you can often get higher yield. But in, in Canada, in 2019 is an excellent example. We have about 100 days to get a crop in the ground. Getting the crop in the ground early in the spring, usually cold soil, and we, we want the, the plant to be able to withstand that cold soil. And then maturing within 100 days and harvesting in 100 days without sprouting, all those things that can happen in the fall. So Canada is quite a unique environment compared to other, where, other parts of the world. Another thing we have to grapple with in wheat breeding is G by E interactions or genotype by environment. This is just a variety or a wheat line and how it interacts in different environments in the prairies, and that can be years as well. So you can see three different varieties in the middle of your screen, a, a blue, a green, and an orange at different sites that have different uh, mean site yields. So you can look at drought, quite a low yield potential on the left, and irrigated, higher yield, yield potential on the right. And we would all mostly like to grow that blue one, I think, because it has quite strong um, resilience in maintaining yield across a range of environments. Another thing we have to grapple with is evolving pathogens. Uh, the rust, they never sleep. Many of the fungi and, uh, that uh, cause a lot of our disease problems don't sleep. They're continually reproducing and evolving to become uh, new, new strains that can affect or overcome much of the disease resistance that we've incorporated. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an ongoing challenge in wheat breeding to continue to incorporate disease resistance genes that are um, that are durable and will last a long time. It's important that we don't rely on single uh, genes and only a single gene for uh, for resistance against a pathogen as it can break down quite rapidly if grown on a large area. So if we look at the chronology, chronology of technologies and breeding, this is a chart that was put together by Curtis Posniak and it's quite quite busy but you can see a year across the bottom from 1930 to 2020 and on the uh, y-axis, the number of yield plots. So a lot of things happen to allow us to do more in wheat breeding. Uh, one of the things was the invention of the plot harvester and cone seeder in the 1970s that really allowed more yield plots to be uh, seeded, so more breeding lines to be evaluated for yield, agronomics, and use quality. And I've highlighted a couple of things that happened in the 1990s and into the early 2000s, and that was doubled haploids first use and marker assisted selection integrated and, uh, and we're going to talk about those more today as that's some of the technology that's been used in AAC Elida. Things that are happening today, I have that up in the right hand corner, like the Science Magazine, um, the Wheat Genome Sequence was released in the last couple of years and you're going to see how uh, varieties that are being released now benefited from those technologies that were integrated in 1990s, early 2000s. So my point here is that wheat genome sequence being released and us knowing the roadmap for wheat, uh, we'll be able to uh, tap into that and the varieties that'll come out in the next 10 to 20 years will benefit from those technologies. So I talked about the doubled haploid technique. It was used in the development of AAC Elida. And this slide just shows what's involved in doubled haploid production right now. It's quite an involved process. We bring together uh, two parents that have contrasting traits of interest, and we try to bring them together in a, in a wheat line that we can select and release as a variety. So that cross is made, and that first seed, the F1 generation we call it, is put into the DH program. 
and we uh, we basically we emasculate it. We take away the male parts, the pollen, and we allow the egg to be there. And we pollinate that plant or that spike with corn pollen, and that tricks the wheat plant into saying, "Oh, I was pollinated. Let's form an embryo." And then we come back about 17 days later, harvest the embryo, and we put it in a vial, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner on specialized media, and we grow it. But that plant has only got half the DNA content that it should, so it would be sterile. So then we treat it with coltracine in the bottom middle of your screen, and that doubles the chromosomes to form what we call the doubled haploid. And that doubled haploid plant is now true breeding in one cycle, versus conventional breeding where it would take upwards of eight, nine cycles to become pure breeding. So that means planting the seed from the plant year after year and being the same plant. So that seed's harvested and then it goes into selection in the breeding program. Another technique, marker-assisted breeding, which has been used quite readily in, in wheat breeding now, 20 years ago wasn't, but it, 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 became, it, it had a lot of promise at the time for being uh, important. So that can be distilled down to being parent A has an economically valuable gene and parent B doesn't have the gene. So what we can do is select, based on this marker, the parents or the lines, the wheat breeding lines that do have the gene and don't have the gene. So I, we would throw out the lines that don't have it because they were not, they would not be of interest economically to us. And you can see in the bottom left-hand corner the relationship of a chromosome to a cell. So wheat has 42 chromosomes and that chromosome is made up of DNA. And you can see in that DNA is a gene and the marker would be closely linked to that gene. So we can run these DNA markers and on the right hand side, you can see what that marker would visualize as being leaf rust resistant or leaf rust susceptible. And that's a nice example because that's exactly the marker that was used in the AAC Elida development. So if you were to produce a thousand wheat breeding lines in the DH program, 50% of them would have LR34 and 50% of them wouldn't. We can throw out the ones that wouldn't have it and it makes our field program that much more efficient because we knew we didn't want the ones that didn't have it. So this is a list of varieties that Swift Current has developed that are doubled haploid or mass. So you can see the variety on the left, the market class that variety belongs to now, the year it was released, whether it's DH or not, whether it's midge resistant or not, and what the trait or gene would have been selected for using markers. And you can see it was kind of a slow start when those technologies first came out, 2003 to 2010, a handful of CWRS or Durham's came out. And then in 2012, after a cycle of breeding had gone through and those technologies got to be more efficient in the breeding program, we've kind of had a, an explosion of varieties that bo use both doubled haploidy and midge resistance or and uh, marker assisted selection, sorry. So a snapshot of AAC Elida's development, the objective was to develop a high grain yield, high grain protein CWRS uh, classification type with orange wheat blossom midge resistance based on the SM1 gene, incorporating short, stronger strawed, improved FHB resistance, uh, targeting at least an MR rating, rust resistance for leaf stem and stripe rust, common bunt resistance, loose smut resistance, and improved grade protection. So protection from sprouting, ideally, which would be higher falling numbers as well. So uh, on the left, you can see year. So the year um, the selections were made in AAC's AAC elided development. And then the uh, explanation within the year of what was done. So in 2008, a cross was made between Carberry and an advanced line from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Winnipeg. That was the donor of SM1 resistance for, for midge and improved FHB resistance. That cross went into the DH program. And in 2009, so within a year, the DH lines were delivered from the DH program, Ron Knox's program, to the breeding site for evaluation and selection in our Swift Current Nursery. Selections went to our Contra Season Nursery in New Zealand for selection and increase. In 2010, they came back and went into yield disease quality selections and seed increase. Selected lines went move forward to 2011 in what we call A tests, so adaptation performance testing. More sites replicated 
for yield, disease, and advanced quality. Selections went forward to B test. More sites again, six to seven per year. And selected lines, there was actually, I believe, three sisters that went into first year registration testing in 2013, and then they were in registration testing at that point, in this case for four years, and then uh, went into uh, licensing when supported for registration and was licensed to CCAN. And just note that ACIDF in Alberta and Western Grains Research Foundation played a role in funding the development of this, uh, this particular variety. So a snapshot, just some pictures to kind of put that into photographs of what this looks like, crossing to double haploidy to the marker-assisted selection that was done in the lab. The first disease nurseries at Swift Current and FHB nurseries in Manitoba. Adaptation trialing that was done in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And then quality testing that would have been appropriate in the advanced tests, extensograph, sprouting, falling number, protein, test weights, trialing for midge resistance and the breeder seed production. Bit of a snapshot. So if we compare doubled haploidy to conventional breeding, and one of the best examples I could come up with is AAC Brandon, as it's quite popular on the prairies right now. Um, on the right, you see the same uh, uh, development scheme that we saw a couple slides ago for AAC Delida, and then we have AAC Brandon's on the left. So you can see that these uh, 2004 to 2007s kind of condensed into a year. So we saved a, a couple years in DHing uh, that cross for AAC Elida compared to AAC Brandon. So DH reduces our time for line development. Um, a lot of the later steps are quite similar. You can't speed those up. Uh, field testing is important over time. It helps develop those lines that are high, stable performing. I would say that each breeding method has its advantages and disadvantages, and we couldn't just say we want to have a whole program of just DHing or just conventional breeding. Each one has their pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages, and we take that into account when we're designing crosses. But DH does uh, is quite attractive for a number of reasons, and one is reducing the cycle time and getting uh, getting to inbred lines faster to allow for more testing in a shorter period of time, and that allows the breeding cycles to become more, more cycles over the same amount of time, and that leads to often better varieties. So the future of wheat breeding, just to kind of take a step back and look at where we've come and where we're going to go, we've come a very long way in 150 years, but there's a lot more to do. Access to genetic tools increases our efficiencies, leads to better varieties. A term for a, probably another webinar would be genomic selection. That's something quite new in the program that'll allow us to discard the bad faster. And what that looks like, I have a, a very uh, busy overview of what that is, but in the breeding program, we're, we're generating a lot of data and a lot of the lines that come out we have a technician that says 99.9% .9 of what we do is garbage. And that's true, but we can learn from it. Um, we're generating a lot of yield, protein, FHB, deoxynivalenol, quality data. And if we're able to, uh, what we call genotype, or look at the market configuration of all the lines in the program and start to use statistics to develop models for what is bad and what is good in the program, and we can genotype the future populations coming through the program, look at their genetic makeup, we can make more informed selections earlier on, and that will make our program more efficient. So we've, we've been spending a lot of time in this area, and uh, we believe it shows a lot of uh, promise for, for improving varieties. Uh, the wheat genome sequence, we have that now. We know there's about 120,000 genes in hexploid wheat. We know the function of only a few genes, so there's lots of basic research to be done. Once we know the function of the genes, uh, I believe gene editing becomes a more promising technology. Right now, with not knowing many of them, it's hard to go in and say which genes we want to edit. Uh, Dr. Ron Knox in our program, he often uses the analogy with me, if there's 120,000 genes, and often there's many different copies of those genes, or alternate forms of those genes. If we looked at the, assuming you could get all of them to recombine in any kind of combination, 
there would be more combinations of those genes than there are atoms in the universe. So there's a lot that we really need to understand there. And we're probably we're right on the edge of that uh, work to be done. So um, all in all, field testing, I believe, will remain king in wheat breeding. But uh, all these things do work together for efficiencies. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. That was awesome. If you have a question for Richard, please type it into the chat box. I have a few questions, Richard. First one, is Swift Current looking to utilize gene editing procedures for breeding in the future? I would say yes. Right now we're working with other groups. Um, the acceptability of it is a concern for me. We wouldn't want it mixed into the program right now if it's not accepted for our end use market. So we have been working with some different groups on a few targeted traits. Um, an area where it, it's, it's most attractive for a breeder is we get to that finish line. We do that decade of work and all those selections and the registration testing and you get a trait that's just off and we call them near misses. So if it's a, uh, if it's a trait that's well understood and uh, the genes underlying it are understood, that's where gene editing could be quite useful because you could go back and you could edit it, edit that advanced line to fix whatever that is. Unfortunately, you probably have to regenerate those plants and then go through some more testing. So that could still take a few years, but it could potentially be shorter than what a breeding cycle would be right now. So that's one area. Another area that I've always, uh, we've always wondered about is uh, in midge resistant varieties, because we grow them in a varietal blend, the susceptible line, choosing it, that it matches very well to the resistant line. Uh, we try to do that as best as we can, but we want them to be the same market class and all those things. So if you could actually take that resistant midge line gene edit SM1 out of it, because that's what we're trying to protect, protect and uh, use that as the refuge, that would be quite interesting as well. Second question, Richard, is there any genotype by environment interaction data that is readily available for producers? Uh, yes and no. Uh, if a variety is registered, uh, it should have proven that it was reasonably stable on across a range of environments. Our registration data is up to 12 sites per year for three years, at a minimum eight per year, I believe. And it should uh, the line should have done well across those if it's registered. Uh, the next best source of information is the seed guides. Um, Typically, lines that do very well will have a high yield in those across a range of environments. Lines that tend to bounce around and have one-off high yields and lower yields at, at most of the locations would show a lower yield in the seed guide. So those would be the two best sources of information right now. With a plethora of high-yielding SRWW lines in the eastern U.S. carrying the FHB1 gene for scab and also carrying stripe rust resistance. When do you think we might see the same in spring wheat lines for Western Canada? In CWRS, at least for Swift Current, a number of them do contain FHB1. It's, it's kind of funny, AC Elida does not actually contain FHB1 and it has very good FHB resistance. So. Another one is AEC Tenacious, which holds the resistant rating in, in Western Canada and a CPS for FHB. That's our, our target for FHB resistance. Rating is resistant now. It also does not have FHB1. So we do rely on FHB1 in breeding. We do incorporate it through marker-assisted selection, but it does not always end up being the most resistant material. So... Um, FHB1, I would, it's anecdotal off the top of my head, but over half of the CWS varieties would probably contain FHB1 right now. Um, stripe rust resistance, uh, generally not bad. Um, a lot of the newer varieties, uh, Carberry, much more. Stettler's been reasonable. Viewfield's been reasonable. Redberry. 
Uh, a light is quite good because it's based on carberries resistance. Uh, Wheatland, Starbuck, a number of the varieties that are coming out now have fairly good stripe rust resistance. Thank you so much, Richard. Our next speaker is Jim Downey. He's Research and Development Manager for Secant, and he's going to talk a little bit about some new varieties coming in 2020. Jim, take it away. Thanks, Richard, for that excellent presentation. I always say that the plant breeders working in the background are like a national treasure for, for Canada and for all farmers in Canada because they really produce the new varieties that we grow, which then become the feedstock for everything else that we do in agriculture, whether it's in grain production or animal production or even food production. They give us the the, uh, the new varieties that become the feedstock. So this is a national treasure and uh, it's our best return on investment. So what they do is extremely important and extremely productive. They say that every dollar we spend on plant breeding you know, returns from 20 to 40 times that dollar that we spend on plant breeding because of all the benefits when those varieties go out onto large acres and then go through the whole ag value added uh, system. So what plant breeders do is extremely important and has huge, huge economic benefits. And I was just trying to demonstrate uh, that in some of these new varieties because we can say, why would we grow this? Well, it's an impro it's a, often an improvement in a disease resistance trait or yield or maturity, et cetera. So they bring us these new traits, uh, new improvements over older varieties that we're already growing. I'm gonna go fairly quickly to cover things. We're gonna start off with AAC Elida. And uh, we should have added the I should have added the letters BB for the varietal blend. This is a new midge tolerant wheat out of Ag Canada Swift Current. Richard Cuthbert is the breeder. It's got Carberry as one of the parents. This one is going to be a very interesting variety because it's giving us yields right in around uh, Brandon, but it's uh, midge tolerant wheat and it's got uh, a very good rating for for lodging and a very good rating for sprouting. I think the very good rating for sprouting and lodging will be the big drivers of this variety, especially after the fall we've had with uh, a lot of har poor harvest conditions. This one is a little bit taller than Carberry, six centimeters taller. Uh, we've gone on to, uh, it's also got a strong, a good MR rating that's moderately resistant to Fusarium head blight. So that's another key feature in this smidge tolerant wheat that it's got uh, this very good resistance to Fusarium and low uh, dawn accumulation, which is the vomitoxin that Fusarium head blight produces. It's also got good resistance to leaf rust, stem rust, stripe rust, and uh, loose smut, and it's intermediate rated for uh, resistance to bunt. It's a little bit weaker in the straw than Carberry, but uh, it still gets a very good rating. That's the co-op rating, but actually in the provincial variety trials, it gets a very good rating. So it actually is very, very close to Carberry in its straw strength, and also has that very good sprouting resistance. Uh, this slide is a little bit of a, the co-op, uh, that's the registration trial data, uh, when this variety went through registration trials. That just shows that uh, yield about 4 or 5% better than Carberry, a little bit taller than Carberry, but the lodging rating, uh, that's uh, the lower the number, the better. It's very close to a Carberry for straw strength. It also has a pretty good falling number there, which then translated into a very good rating for sprouting. Just looking at a few pictures of Elida. This is a bearded wheat. Uh, you can see it's just a touch taller than Brandon. So this is a, just looking down at it a bit lower Elida versus Brandon. You can see a, a touch taller in height, but overall looks somewhat similar. So this variety, uh, Elida will have uh, the very good rating for sprouting where Brandon was rated as poor. So that's a, it's a very big improvement over the Brandon in the sprouting the resistance to sprouting. Uh, just a, another picture on the next slide of Brandon versus Elida at a different location. And then the next slide again, this is uh, Brandon, Elida, and Tisdale. We'll talk about Tisdale in a few minutes. Gonna move on to another new hard red spring wheat. This one's called AAC Warm and VB. I missed the VB in my title there. This one is another midge tolerant wheat out of Ag Canada in Brandon. Santosh Kumar was the breeder. It's got uh, AC cane and Olsen in the background and some of, uh, some of the parents. I call uh, warm in a conventional height variety because it's very similar in height to older varieties like uh, 
AC Unity and AAC Jetheria. So this would be a typical conventional height, uh, midge tolerant wheat, very good yields, uh, typical high yield for a midge tolerant wheat. So you'd have Brandon as the refuge. Uh, a little bit earlier than Carberry and uh, quite a bit taller than Carberry, so 13 centimeters taller, and that's uh, taken from the registration trials. The big improvement in Warman is that it has a very strong MR rating, moderately resistant to Fusarium head blight. So that is a very good rating. Uh, this one also showed very low dawn accumulation, so that gives us uh, probably one of our best hard red spring wheats for resistance to Fusarium head blight. Uh, this variety also is a stronger straw than Unity. That's a uh, previous or uh, an older uh, midge tolerant wheat. And uh, it's resistant to leaf rust, stem rust, and loose smut. Overall, this would be kind of our best conventional height midge tolerant wheat, and it'll be new for this coming spring. Uh, uh, moving on to the, uh, the, the table of the registration trial data. Uh, this one uh, shows the Warman in comparison to Carberry and Viewfield. We can see it's got that 10 or 11 percent better yield than Carberry, a uh, fair bit taller than Carberry, so that about 11 centimeters taller, and uh, a bit weaker in the straw than Carberry, but still an improvement over old varieties like Unity. Just a few pictures of Warman. This is Warman by itself. Again, a fairly tall bearded wheat is. Uh, a distant shot of Warman versus Unity. It is looking at Unity versus Warman a bit closer up, and you can see they ve look very similar to each other. So that's AEC Warman VB, a uh, big improvement over Unity in a midge tolerant wheat with better fusarium reading and stronger straw than Unity. We're going to move on to Parada. This is a new hard red spring wheat that comes out of the uh, University of Alberta from Dean Spainer's program. This one has uh, some Splendor and AEC Domain and CDC Go in the background as parents. It's on the hollow stemmed, uh, early maturing and susceptible to midge, so it's not midge tolerant. Uh, this one is uh, uh, gives us Carberry yields or a bit more than Carberry. Uh, this one in the Saskatchewan Sea Guide it looks like it's approaching Brandon and yield up to about 105% of Carberry. Uh, this one has uh, about eight centimeters taller than Carberry and about two to four days earlier than Carberry. So this would be uh, our closest variety for being an uh, AC, AAC Redwater replacement. So this is a, basically an earlier maturing hard red spring wheat for the Northern Parkland and Peace River region. Got a fair rating for lodging and sprouting, so that's an improvement over some of the older parkland wheats, and uh, fairly good resistance to stem rust, leaf rust, stripe rust, but it is rated intermediate resistance to Fusarium head blight. So it's one day later ma uh, maturing than Redwater. And the next slide shows uh, Parada from the registration trials in comparison to some of the Czech varieties like Splendor. Overall, we've got a uh, early maturing hard red spring wheat, rated intermediate for Fusarium head blight, a uh, little bit taller than Carberry, but yields uh, can approach up to the Brandon level in an early maturing wheat. So that should be popular in the Parkland region. If we go on to just a couple pictures of Parada, this is Dean Spainer in the plots at uh, University of Alberta, just showing Parada is maturing very early, much earlier than most of the other wheats around, uh, wheat varieties around it. Uh, just a shot of uh, Parada in Manitoba under seed increase, uh, standing up well, and uh, just a nice height variety, uh, more of a conventional height, a bit taller than Carberry, is a picture of Parada just in the plots, showing that again earlier maturity, uh, a little bit earlier than the wheat around it, the wheat varieties. This one is uh, called AAC Tisdale. This is another new hard red spring wheat from uh, Ag Canada Swift Current from Richard Cuthbert's program. It's uh, some parents like Somerset and Wascadia in the background. It's an on semi dwarf wheat. And uh, the interesting part here is this is a bit earlier maturing than Carberry, but it gets the moderately resistant rating to Fusarium head blight. So it gets a good MR rating, which makes it one of our uh, one of the few early maturing hard red springs 
that's also MR for Fusarium Headlight. And this one gives us, uh, looks like it gives us yields very similar to Brandon. And uh, Tisdale is interesting because it would also have uh, the highest protein uh, ratings in the Saskatchewan Seed Guide. So this variety shows up with uh, that good yield and good protein, but being earlier maturing than Carberry. So a nice variety for that uh, northeast Saskatchewan and the Parkland region where they want that earlier maturity along with some protein. It's rated fair for lodging and fair for sprouting. Large seed, um, a little bit taller and a little bit weaker straw than Carberry, but still acceptable. Uh, resistant to leaf and stem rust, uh, moderately susceptible to stripe rust. So that's just one watch out on that variety. Rated fair for lodging and sprouting. AAC Tisdale, they're just giving the registration trial data. It's uh, much better than some of the parkland wheats like Splendor for yield and an improvement in uh, a little bit shorter straw and a little bit stronger straw in that co-op data. And again, showing pretty high, high protein in that co-op data. So that's AAC Tisdale, just to see a few pictures of Tisdale. Again, an on semi-dwarf type wheat is uh, Tisdale versus AC Carberry. Uh, you can see in that picture, just that uh, taller straw versus Carberry, both being on. And the next slide, Tisdale versus Brandon. Brandon and Carberry are very similar in height. Again, Tisdale being a bit taller than Brandon. I'm gonna move on to uh, AC Goodwin, CPS uh, Red Wheat. This is an interesting new CPS Red Wheat. It's Canada Prairie Spring Wheat class. This comes out of Ag Canada uh, through Richard Cuthbert's program. This was a cross of uh, Carberry by Cadillac. So this variety is, uh, was really, this first cross was meant to develop a hard red spring wheats, uh, but AEC Goodwin did not have quite the quality parameters for uh, to make it into the CWRS class, so it uh, was registered as a CPS red wheat. And at the time when this was registered, it would be the one of the better, well, the best yielding uh, hard red spring if it had been registered as a hard red spring. It was about 14% better yield than Carberry. So this was uh, quite a high yielding wheat. Uh, it was, uh, and it still shows up as one of our highest yielding CPS red wheats in the Saskatchewan Seed Guide. It's uh, a day earlier than Carberry. Height is about equal to Carberry. So this is a short, strong strawed wheat, good, rated good for lodging and rated good for sprouting. So this is uh, a very nice CPS red wheat. And the idea here is that this variety might actually give you uh, some of the highest protein in the CPS red wheat and also give you very good yield. So this variety, when it came through registration trials, was only uh, just a little bit lower in protein than AC Carberry. It's also rated to resistant to leaf rust and stripe rust, intermediate to stem rust. It does have an uh, intermediate resistance to Fusarium headlight, so it's not quite as good uh, as some, some of the other newer wheats that are rated uh, moderately resistant to Fusarium headlight. It's a little bit later than Penhold, but it should have uh, a higher yield than Penhold. Next slide. There's just a few pictures of AAC Goodwin. This is a picture where it reminds me of Brandon. It's got a little bit floppier head. This was taken at Lethbridge in 2016. This is just a picture of uh, Richard Cuthbert with Goodwin at uh, Swift Current 2016. You can see typical looking, looks much more like a, a hard red spring wheat, but uh, will be registered as a CPS red. Just a shot of it there at Winnipeg, standing up very well. And the next slide in, is in relation to, or in contrast to Penhold, another CPS red wheat. Penhold, Penhold would be our shortest, strongest strawed CPS red. And you can see, uh, as we go to the next slide, uh, it's a bit taller than varieties like Penhold and Foremost. Penhold Foremost being both being uh, much shorter. So this variety, good one, is, uh, is a bit taller, but gives us better protein and, and really nice yield. And the next slide is just some of the registration trial data uh, on Goodwin. When it came through the registration trials, about 14% better yield than Carberry. Height, uh, very similar to Carberry. Lodging uh, resistance very close to being almost as good as, Car as Carberry for lodging. And the grain protein was just only a little bit lower than Goodwin. So that's a huge yield jump 
and not we're not losing much protein. So that's the uh, new wheat varieties for this coming spring. I'm just going to add a few words about uh, a few other crop kinds. I'm just going to talk about uh, two new flax varieties. Uh, one is uh, AAC Bright, which is yellow seeded flax, and CDC Plava. So AAC Bright, this will be our first yellow seeded flax for CCAN. This comes out of Ag Canada Morden from Scott Duguid's program. The big claim to fame on this new variety is that it uh, yields about 94% of CDC Bethune. So typically the yellow seeded flax varieties have been uh, very, fairly low yielding. So this one uh, yields much more than older yellow seeded flax like uh, like Nugget, we're 12% better than Nugget, 13% better than Omega. And uh, and also much stronger strawed than some of the older yellow seed to flax variety. So this this variety is actually stronger straw than Bethune, uh, a little bit later, just a touch taller, but smaller seed size than Bethune. So the next uh, next slide. So this is uh, so that was AEC Bright. Um, that one is uh, yellow seeded and should be available for to farmers this coming spring. To talk about uh, CDC Plava. Uh, the claim to fame on Plava is that it is a uh, an early maturing flax variety. So this is just a picture of Plava versus Sorrel. Sorrel has been fairly widely grown, partly because it has larger seed. Plava should be more known as an early maturing flax, and we can see in this picture that it does look a bit earlier than Sorrel right beside it. So just a description of CDC Plava. This uh, is the first seed can variety that flax variety that came through the Northern Flax Co-op registration trials. So they're looking for adaptation to the northern prairies. This had about 6% better yield than Bethune. It was about two days earlier than Bethune and a little bit shorter straw than Bethune. Although it did seem to be just a little bit weaker in the straw, so not quite as good for lodging resistance and slightly smaller seed than Bethune. If we look at uh, the Flax Co-op registration trial data, this is just showing the Plava with the better yield. Uh, maturity was a bit earlier. Uh, but just a bit weaker in the straw. The lodging rating, the, the lower the number, the better. And this one, you can see the lodging rating is just a little bit higher number than Bethune. Uh, but it still has very good oil content and linolenic acid content. Next slide. Um, just before I finish Plava then, so that's uh, that's an early maturing flax that would uh, do quite well for in the northern prairies. Moving on, to, just to talk a little bit about uh, a couple new... Uh, Two row malting barley varieties. Just want to speak a little bit about CDC Bow and uh, and a couple other varieties too, like uh, potentially like CDC Fraser. So to start with CDC Bow, this is just a picture of Bow versus uh, Copeland and Meredith. CDC Bow is a uh, it's a new two row malting barley variety. This is a stronger straw than Copeland, Metcalf, and Zena. So this would be our strongest straw two row malting barley, I believe, on the market. About 9% better yield than Metcalf, uh, one day later than Metcalf, and just a centimeter taller. So virtually pretty close to Metcalf, but much better yield, much better straw strength. Very large plump kernels, and uh, replacement possibly for varieties like Metcalf and Copeland. This one has the grain protein similar to Copeland. In other words, grain protein would be a half to 1% lower than AC Metcalf. So that's an important uh, trait so that the variety can be accepted for malting. Quite often if we get hot and dry on the prairies, malting barley tends to get too high in protein. And so this variety being lower protein than Metcalf will help it to get accepted for malt more readily. It's got enzyme levels between Copeland and Metcalf. That seems to be where the market wants the enzymes to be. Uh, low beta glucan, which is a kind of a gummy substance which can gum things up when it's in the uh, brewing process. Very high extract, and it's in been in seed multiplication, but there's lots of seed out there now. So this uh, variety, CDC Bow, should is available for this spring. CDC Bow, just a bit of co-op registration trial data that shows the the better yield than Metcalf and the stronger straw than Metcalf. This is just a picture showing uh, Bow in one of its first years of seed increase out in near Lacombe. They get a lot of lodging there, but Bow here stood up very very well that year, on a on a very high yielding crop. The next uh, picture is Aaron Beatty, the breeder from Crop, Devel crop Development Center, uh, comparing Bow on the left with Fraser on the right. And uh, 
the next picture is uh, Bow in the middle, Fraser on the right with AC Synergy. Synergy starting to lodge a little bit at the back of the plot. These are long strips for seed increase. And so Bo is showing us a little bit earlier maturity, uh, but along with very, very good straw strength. Next picture was Synergy versus Bo, just a little bit closer up. So the maltsters have been working with uh, Bo for several years now, and uh, it's gaining acceptance, especially with Canada malt. So there should be contracting opportunities to produce uh, Bo, both for the domestic market and for export markets too. So that's CDC Bo, and that's uh, named after the Bo River. CDC Fraser. So this is another two-row malting barley variety. It's just slightly behind CDC Bo in its uh, development phase. Uh, this one's named after the Fraser River. So another new two-row malting barley variety. Uh, again, stronger straw than Metcalf and Copeland, but it's not quite as strong in the straw as CDC Bow. This is a, should be a top-yielding two-row malt, about 14% better yield than Metcalf, rated intermediate for Fusarium head blight, where Bow was rated as moderately susceptible to FHB. So this variety is an improvement over Bow for uh, Fusarium head blight resistance. Uh, one day later than Metcalf and a centimeter shorter than Metcalf, large plump kernels, and uh, should overall give us a top yield. Still on CDC Fraser. Protein similar to Copeland, so again, that 0.7 to 1% lower protein than Metcalf, which would be good to get it selected for malt. Again, enzymes between Copeland and Metcalf, uh, low beta-glucan, high extract. So uh, overall saying that's got very good malting quality, and uh, just a bit of co-op data showing that the 14% better yield than Metcalf, and uh, stronger straw than, than Metcalf and Copeland. So then that's uh, CDC Fraser. Again, seed available this spring. Canada malts uh, and other maltsters are liking what they're seeing with this variety. So we're hoping for very good things on CDC Fraser. I always tell farmers when they're looking at two, new two-row malting barley varieties that they should try them, but not seed the whole farm to them because there is a limited market when the varieties are, are fairly new. So that's something to just keep in mind. I'm just going to mention a couple oat varieties. The next slide is uh, a picture of Morgan on the left versus uh, ORE3542M. This, uh, the ORE stands for Oat Research, and then the number of the line is 3542, and the M stands for milling. This is a oat variety out of uh, Jim Dick's program. He's a private oat breeder out of Saskatoon, and he's got a couple new varieties showing a, a shorter, stronger straw. You can see it quite a bit shorter than Morgan in that picture, along with very good milling quality. So that's ORE3542M. And the next picture is 3542M uh, contrasted to Ronald. Ronald was a semi-dwarf oat, very short, strong straw. And you can see in this picture, they're looking similar. The next picture is 3541M. So this is like a sister line to 3542. And they're both showing that short, strong straw there. Next picture was uh, 3541M grown in Portage La Prairie. Uh, very high yielding, 192 bushel an acre, acre, and it stood up very well. They get a lot of lodging pressure at Portage La Prairie. So if a variety stands up at Portage, that's usually pretty good news for straw strength. The next picture is uh, 3542M grown at, uh, in Thursby, Alberta. Again, pretty good yield and stood up very well. So uh, overall, sea growers have been very happy with these varieties so far for yield and standability. 3541, Leggett by Minstrel Cross, uh, yield pretty close to Morgan, a little bit earlier than Morgan, and uh, a little bit shorter than Morgan. We've seen that in the pictures. And resistant to crown rust and smut is 3542M. And this one is, uh, again, Sister line to 3541, Leggett by Minstrel Cross, um, maturity equal Morgan yield, a little bit higher yield than 3541, a little shorter than Morgan, stronger than Morgan, and again resistant to crown rust, and a high percent of plump kernels. Just some co-op data to reinforce those points, showing the yields of 3541 versus 3542. Uh, 42 looks like it's a little bit uh, higher yielding and a little stronger strawed. And uh, the test weight, though, a 3541 is a bit, is the highest of the two. But uh, the plumpness is pretty good on, on, on both varieties. I'm just going to mention uh, one uh, 
one variety of winter wheat that's uh, also going to be new this spring, and that's AEC Wildfire. So this is a picture of wildfire versus CDC moats. Moats is still widely growing in Saskatchewan. AEC Wildfire is uh, a new winter wheat out of Ag Canada Lethbridge, and it also has bronze chaff, so you can kind of see a reddish uh, tinge in the heads. Just the next picture is just wildfire on its own with some white uh, what varieties around it that have white chaff. You can just see the difference in color. And then the next slide will be uh, Radiant on the left, then Wildfire in the middle, then AAC Elevate on the right. You can see again the difference in the bronze chaff, kind of that reddish tinge in the head versus the white chaff of most of the other winter wheats. It's uh, When we look in the Saskatchewan Seed Guide, AAC Wildfire is by far the highest yielding variety in the guide. When it came through registration trials, it had about 9% uh, better yield than, than CDC moats. Uh, and uh, short, strong straw, and rated MR, or moderately resistant to Fusarium head blight, also resistant to the Russian weed aphid. So Wildfire offers this really high, good yield, uh, stripe rust resistance, good winter survival, a little bit later maturity, but excellent lodging resistance. That We just compare uh, Wildfire on the bottom to moats at the top, and you can see that Yield increase about nine ten percent in Saskatchewan seed guide. It's more like a fifteen percent jump over moats and uh, moats and buteo and uh, shorter and stronger straw. And that's about it for uh, new varieties for the for, for now. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you, Richard, and thank you to our audience for spending your lunch hour with us on today's webinar sponsored by CCAN. This webinar will be available for viewing within 24 hours. Just visit our website, germination.ca. Thanks again, and have a great day, everybody.